Uh, it is the 18th of September in 2024. Uh, Vida and I had a great conversation last week where we were thinking about all kinds of stuff about how knowledge works and how uh, people use tools to share knowledge and a bunch of other stuff that kind of converged. So we thought we'd uh, come back together and uh, basically lay it out in a little bit more detail and have a conversation about some of the questions that come up when you're kicking around these ideas. Um, we come at this from pretty different places, uh, but I think our goals or our ambitions in the space are really quite resonant, which is nice. Um, and I'll, I'll just start from where I come from. Uh, back in 1997, I was introduced because I was a tech analyst and I had a briefing from a company that had a piece of software called The Brain, which I promptly became addicted to and am still using. So I've got in, in December, in a couple months, it'll be 27 years that I've been feeding one mind map. And so a lot of my ideas about what knowledge might do uh, and how knowledge should accrue or accumulate and what a tool for thinking does come out of my experience sort of using that tool. Um, and I'll, I'll just pause there because there's plenty more to say there, but that, that's just a start. And if you want to pull yourself in, yeah. in that way as well. Well, yeah, I mean, I have so many questions around that as well, but I think, uh, Probably what we do have in common around this topic and theme in general is an interest in how we can use technology to unlock human potential and creativity and more knowledge. And for me, even the term technology is pretty loose. It doesn't necessarily have to mean a piece of software or anything of that sorts. But I've been thinking about this from the perspective of um, well, getting really overwhelmed at how many problems we have in the world to solve, it's just too many. And if you're a young person, um, like I was when I was a teenager, I just like, I could not figure out which problem I should start working on because there's just simply too many. And so many of them feel incredibly important and urgent and something that we need to solve immediately. So like through this process of thinking, I started realizing that if there are so many like incredibly important and urgent problems, there's probably something sort of underneath that that we should also look at, which is how we can actually create enough like collective capacity, wisdom, um, knowledge to be able to solve these problems. So I've been fascinated with uh, thinking about how we can unlock human potential um, for a very long time. And that has taken me through all different kinds of paths and directions and Definitely think that technology is one of them. And I think that there probably couldn't be a better time to be having this conversation than now with um, generative AI LLMs and and the conversation is changing as a result. So I guess that's what we're going to talk about today. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and the thing I was just thinking was that I forgot to mention that a big piece of our conversation last time was, hey, how does Gen AI, Gen AI change this formula? And in particular, we're both interested in like, what is the connector between humans and, and, and this Gen AI? I don't think it's just the prompt interface. So there's a, there's a worldview out there that, hey, we should stop taking notes, stop worrying about all these things so much, stop trying to illustrate how our ideas fit or connect or anything like that. The, the, the AIs, the LLMs are just going to eat the world and then spit it back out to us as answers to prompts. And I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, yeah, no, I don't, I don't think that's a complete world. I think that's actually possibly a dangerous scenario. And I'm really interested in how what we think and what we're trying to get done meets these AIs in some kind of space out there and in, in, in some places where we can hold uh, conversations with one another, um, enhanced by or informed by what the AIs see and onward from there. Um, yeah. Well, before we talk about maybe some of the ideas or proposed solutions or what's out there right now in terms of how people are thinking about solving some of these problems. I'm curious, like as someone who has used, um, like actively used a tool for thinking and documented um, your experiences and thoughts and whatnot, like how has your experience changed or your idea about what you're doing developed over time? Has it ever wavered as in like, does this make any sense? Or have you always felt this deep conviction about about documenting your your ideas? Um, it's a wonderful question. When I first saw the tool, when the inventor, Harlan Hugh, opened his laptop and demoed it for me, my wet brain was like, oh, 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 that's kind of how I think. And 
when they let me use the software a month before they did general availability, um, I didn't need coaching. I didn't need an instruction manual. I was like, oh, okay, I'll just do this. I'll just do that. And it was fun to arrange it the way I wanted to arrange it. And so I got quickly addicted. And because at the moment then I was a tech industry trends analyst, I needed to know who competes with whom, who invested in whom, what are the product categories, how do they connect, all that stuff. And I've I've not found any other tool even since where I could model that and then and then cruise through it. So I'd get a call from a journalist somewhere and they'd say, I'm writing a, an article about buddy lists or instant messaging. And I would quietly just look up, you know, instant messaging in my brain. And there would be the 200 different offers that I'd ever heard of. And my unaided recall of buddy lists might be eight or 12, right? And, and so that helped from the start. Um, I think I've had concerns that the brain company would not be alive over time. And that's given me a couple of nerves over, over time, but I've never, it's very interesting. You asked it that way because I've never wavered from, this is super useful. I wish other people understood it the way I understand it. I wish I could collaborate with other people and the brain software does have a team brain mode, but it doesn't work the way I want it to work or need it to work. So I don't ever really use that. So every, everything that's in my brain file, I put in by hand. And I don't mind the work. It's 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 a little bit of curating work all the time, um, and Jenny I could be extremely helpful to me in how I curate. Um, and while the brain has added some some Gen AI features, they haven't added that one. There's like six different ways you could imagine Gen AI being helpful here. That's not one of them yet. But I use the analogy of of, of farmer ants a lot. And if farmer ants are leaf cutter ants, right? And they're um, they're busy cutting leaves and taking them into the, the the hive, but they can't metabolize leaves. They they can't actually digest leaves. So what are they doing? They're feeding the leaves a mulched up to a fungus that they tend, which is why they're called farmer ants. And I have felt like a lone ant at the fungus face for 26 and some years because I feel like I'm feeding a mycelial network that needs to reach out and connect to yours and to other people's at the other ends. Uh, I want to find other people who are obsessed with trying to externalize what they think and how they think it in, in ways that allow us to use our preferred tools. So I don't think everybody should be using this one, but in ways that allow us to compare notes, set up experiments, uh, question each other, do de debates or s other kinds of things. All of that is like in, in in my quest and it's hard yeah well yeah it's hard because note taking is hard <laughs> uh i don't think most people take a lot of notes and it's unfortunately true i don't take a lot of notes i i should um but i just can't get around to doing it like it's too laborious i so you know like so a few of my friends just launched this product called Granola, you know, Chris and, and Sam. Um, yeah, but I don't know, I don't know Granola. So Granola is a new like AI um, note taking meeting tool. It just plays in the background um, or it transcribes you in the background and then enhances your own notes based off a meeting. And that's the best note taking tool that I've ever tried. Shout out to Chris and Sam, because you don't have to do anything. <laughs> it just sits there and it, makes notes based off of the conversations that you're having. I would basically want something like this for everything, something that could just scrape all the data on my phone, across all my devices, figure out what I'm thinking about doing and make notes based off of that. That would be a good use of Gen AI for me because I do actively, like if I ever have a scrap of note every, anywhere, I will go back to try and find it if I'm trying to write something, which I do pretty often, but my, mo my note taking skills are just abhorrent so it's not usually very useful but um yeah i feel like that's a definitely like a direction for gen a, for a gen ai application that might be actually it's kind of like doing what you're doing but automating it <laughs> exactly and I, and I don't take continuous notes in pages I'm, I'm in a bunch of meetings where we're busy taking collaborative notes maybe um you know writing in a document together but i find that long documents with notes are very interesting intermediate products, but they don't help me in the long run because they contain lots of different ideas jumbled together in the order they happen to happen in some one call, right? And so I'm interested in the nuggets. I'm interested right. I'm interested in how each of those connects to what it refers to. So I'm 
I'm busy as we're talking, adding granola to my brain, and I'm going to add it to note-taking tools and to other things that I've heard of that can process Zoom meetings and give you some synthesized output of what happened, et cetera, like that, um, which is a different form of note-taking than usual. So, so I'm, I'm interested in how notes and note-taking, you know, we all use Wikipedia, but only a few thousand people actually ever get in and, and edit and contribute to it. It's the the yeah. number of people who've created Wikipedia is surprisingly small. So I think that this space where we can think together doesn't mean we need to force everybody to take notes all of a sudden. It means we need to be clever in our uses of AI and our uses of our time to make this stuff more useful. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, the, from what I said, just when we started this conversation about this, like unlocking human potential, I think it's so much more to do with creativity than productivity. Like productivity has been an essential um you know, component of getting us to where we're at today. But since we are, we've been able to create so many different tools to automate and delegate different types of tasks. And um, I think that the ambition with building these kinds of tools and doing these types of things is to create more time for for sort of higher order missions, but we're still not doing that. We're just like trying to do more productivity related stuff uh, after using all these productivity tools. And I think that with AI, it's we have this sort of like even a window of opportunity to really reflect on this even more philosophically and think about like, okay, what is the what is the purpose of all of this? Like, what kind of work do we want to do? Who are we as human beings? Like, could we actually like redefine the essence of being human away from like productivity more towards like creativity, serendipity, become more like intellectually and spiritually enriched beings. And if if generative AI could just play such a huge role in this, then I'm very excited about thinking what that can do. So yeah, I don't know if there's anything to sort of mention, like kind of tying it back to the note taking and what that means. Like, uh, you kind of mentioned that you you go back into the brain and discover things that you would have otherwise forgotten in order to maybe connect some dots and create a new idea. Is that the sort of ultimate purpose of what you of why you're doing what you're doing? Or yeah, how, how do you think about that? I'm un, I'm unclear if I have an ultimate purpose, but I certainly have a variety of purposes that matter a lot to me. One of which is the one you just described. Um, another insight is that we don't share enough with the with others. Um, I did a podcast with Tiago Forte uh, back when we were doing the the camp with uh, Betaworks. And I learned from the podcast current conversation that Tiago's second brain, because he has the build a second brain thing, his second brain is his private note-taking system. His third brain is when he externalizes something as a blog post or as whatever else. And those things, we don't put out a lot of media, right? That those are those are rare things. For me, Everything I add to my brain on any given day is publicly visible unless I go check a little box and open a dialogue and check a box that makes it private. So my setting is by default online. When I use Obsidian and push markdown files to GitHub to write all the things I'm trying to write, all those are by intentionally on GitHub because they're public there and there's a version control system and there's a sharing method or an, you know collective thinking method and the programmers understand, but not muggles, you know, ordinary people aren't busy using GitHub to write documents together. But it's a it's a primitive way of trying to approximate that. And I love your emphasis on creativity versus productivity because it seems like we're stuck in personal productivity tools. Our boundary yeah. is in, we're very internally focused, and it's about productivity and how do I maximize my time effectiveness as opposed to creativity and thinking together. And, and there aren't enough of those. I, I, I can't, you know, mural and Miro, but... You get six people editing a Miro board and it turns into chaos in no time. The, the, you know, unless you have a really good architect for uh, what you're trying to get done, who then enforces it with the participants, those things don't always go that well. Um, I, I, I miss that we I, I miss the kinds of things that are probably in the next wave of what's possible here. Yeah, well, also because even if we even if we get together to have like some kind of mirror session about some ideas, like I think 99.9% .9 of the time that will still be for the purpose of being productive, of producing something, of having a concrete output. I think 
I think that that's the sort of like more fundamental like societal change that um, I think we have an opportunity to think about creating as a result of AI is what is the purpose of any given meeting, any given project? Like, what are we doing? Because I, I notice myself like all the time having this experience that whenever I take a vacation, I get so much more work done than when I'm not on vacation. Because on any given vacation, I have the liberty to to read, to think, to do whatever I want. And usually those, like all of my best ideas come from going on vacation and having the space to imagine something. Um, and as like AI takes a lot of the work that we've been historically doing away from us, there is more space and there is more time and we can choose whether to use the space and time for actually trying to deepen our creativity. And I think that that's something that a lot of people, myself included, will have to completely learn from, from scratch. It's like, it's not something that I've been trained for or conditioned to have this space and in, in my life to do because of the world that we've, we've been living in, but there is an opportunity now to try to create enough distance, um, and redefine like what work for humans can look like. And yeah, I feel like that's a whole segue that we could go deeper into, but I'm curious to hear if you have any thoughts. Um, you're reminding me of a conversation I had just in the last couple of days, but I'm forgetting with whom, where one of the things that came up was, hey, as companies start to adopt these tools, one of the things that's happening is the deadlines are just tightening. So, hey, I know that we used to give you a week to come up with a creative program for an ad campaign, but you can probably do all this work in a couple hours now. So we're going to give you like three or four ad campaigns to do within that week. And so instead, instead of having the space that you just described, what we're going to have is more overwhelm of like the human trying to manage more things that got done more quickly. And also to have to proof the work that comes out of more engines, because you at this point still, and I don't know how long it'll take, but you don't want to send anything out uh, without having read through it and make sure that it's what you think you would do and correct and edit it and prove it, right? Um, yeah. so, so we're increasing that, which may in fact decrease our time to be creative. We, in America in particular, like you get a job in Europe and the laws give you five weeks vacation when you start. Like your first day, you have five weeks vacation in the year. In America, we get two weeks and a couple holidays and some people take them, some people don't, but we have this crazy overly um, uh, Calvinistic work ethic that basically says, you know, just just go work yourself. And it's sort of worse in Japan, I understand, uh, where people actually don't take their holidays. Uh, we need to slack up a little bit so that humans can be creative and appreciate and use these tools for the creative possibilities they present. And, and I'm afraid that our very, you know, left brain efficiency and productivity oriented selves aren't really doing that in this early go in particular because everybody's looking for ROI around the tools. Yeah. In particular, the tool vendors who are spending ungodly amounts of money on processing on, you know, to buy CPU power um, and not making that much money yet from subscriptions, they're also driven heavily by, by ROI, unfortunately. Yeah, I think that the that's where this sort of like redefinition of the essence of work and human life is actually really crucial. Like it won't happen accidentally. It has to be intentional. Like we need to think about what we're doing and where we're going. And like um, Scott Belsky, I think is the one who wrote this where he said like that productivity is about just like squeezing all the juice out of existing resources where creativity is about coming up with new resources. So I think a lot of people have to, also do the intentional effort of um you know like if we like yes you could just do a lot of the same things that you've been doing faster and get more of that done but what's the end result of that it's probably like it's just gonna like it's it's sort of linear but then if you actually take that same amount of time like you do the same amount of work that you did historically before ai using the AI tools, you get that done in 20% of the time as you used to, and use that 80% of the time to actually think, to innovate, to create. I'm sure that the second option I just described is the, gonna be the ultimate winner, even in markets, even in like a capitalist uh, undertaking. So I'm not trying to like push some kind of, uh, you know, like leftist agenda onto people and saying that people should just work less and play more uh, for the sake of pure human welfare, which is important. I'm also saying that it's something that can make you win uh, 
it's a competitive advantage to businesses and other organizations. And that's why it's so exciting because it feels like if done right, there doesn't need to be a loser in this game that we're trying to redefine. Exactly. What, um, when you're thinking about these things and looking ahead a bit, is there a vision you have or a wish you have or some, some description of what this could be like? Um, roll it out three to five years. It doesn't have to roll out that far because things are moving so quickly. Well, so yeah, you obviously know like what we're doing with saying is sort of more or less the process that we've been through and trying to think through some of these problems and ideas. And like I mentioned in the beginning, like the unlocking human potential has always been the sort of like mission or purpose of, of what we've been doing. And it's taken different routes and paths of discovery and understanding on what is the most efficient way to actually unlock this human potential. And that like thesis of like creativity versus productivity has very much been there since the beginning. And, um, and I think ultimately we've kind of landed on, on an approach where we understand that humans are inherently creative beings and there's always sort of like a seed and a starting point um humans are also very bad at instructing machines um understanding fundamentally how they work and how to talk to them um so that's number two and number three is that they're so we basically need to bridge the gap between one and and two so i think that the fact that most of these tools that we're working with, these AI tools that we're working uh, with require people to know how to write prompts or even like, you know, fast forward a little bit, just do natural language commands in like any format anywhere is sort of thinking that human beings are naturally think like machines or that machines naturally think like humans mm -hmm. and making a distinction between human intelligence, like natural human intelligence and machine intelligence and understanding both for what they are and appreciating both for what they are um, can make solving this problem much, much easier. So I think that getting rid of like humans needing to know how to write prompts or instructing machines in this way is like step number one that we need to do. So um, at Sane, we've been playing around and, and, and building demos on how we could basically create a discovery engine that allows people to find what they're looking for by the machine observing them in their natural creative workflow. So um, we built this thing that we call the space, which is a spatial interface, um, a canvas, a minimalist digital canvas, where you can add image, text, video, link, audio, whatever you want. And when you add something to that canvas, you can open up that discovery engine that we call the library and get recommended ideas that relate to what you're currently thinking about and working on. So ultimately the AI behind saying understands you as a user, but it also understands the context in which you're operating in. So mm -hmm. an example of what this might look like in the future is that you go to a farmer's market and you buy a bunch of vegetables because they look pretty and you're just get caught up in, in a Saturday afternoon buying beautiful things that you don't really know what they are or what to do with. So you get home and you're like, okay, well, what now? What can I make of all this? You take a picture, add it to your space on Sane and immediately get recommended uh, recipes like tableware, olive oil, things that you can actually make um, with those vegetables that you just bought that is also personalized to your aesthetic and creative tastes as a user. So these type of things are completely possible now in a gen AI world. And, but I think it's a question of what kind of interfaces are we building? How are we actually designing the user experience? Like what is the product innovation layer on top of all these LLMs that actually respect human intelligence and creativity for what that is and the machine intelligence for that and not to get the two confused. Yeah, I love going to Asian grocery stores and we have a couple of really big Asian markets here in Portland <clears throat> and I still have never cooked bitter melon, but I'm dying to know like, what do people do with bitter melon? I can't believe you just said that because this is like the bitter melon was such a thing of last weekend. I went to the Bernal what? Heights farmer's market and I was just like looking at all these bitter melons and I had no idea what they are. And they're yeah. like, they're bitter melons. Like this one's from India. This one's from China originally. And I was just like, I want to buy these so they look badly. Like but... with warts. It's like they're the ugly thing, but, but, but apparently they're quite good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I want to go back to what you were just talking about, about how we apply this AI. And one of the things that seems to bug me a lot or it's nagging on my brain on my this one um, is this idea of humanoid AI or 
or that the standard for what we're building toward is us, is like how humans think and how humans look. So there's, you know, robotic startups that are doing androids uh, that, that are bipedal creatures that walk around kind of, they're shaped like us, they're not great yet. Um, and there seems to be this vision that we're just going to have a lot of those running around, which seems very stupid to me. Like, like that seems like an insane vision. And then we're holding these AIs up to the Turing test, which I think we're, we're passing right now. So I was at, a, at an event this weekend where a really smart guy was talking about how he was trying to develop Turing 2. Like we seem to have passed the Turing test of, can I tell whether the thing behind the curtain is human or machine? Can't tell anymore. Okay, great. So what's next? But I was sort of like, you know, I've, these are different intelligences and they think differently and they'll probably have different virtues and different weaknesses um, and they'll adapt and make up for them more quickly than we can biologically. That's for damn sure. But why don't we let them become what they're going to become and use them in complementary ways to everything we're doing? Just like a physical robot, if all you're doing is lifting boxes, like just have a little forklift on wheels and let it move around and lift boxes. Why have a robot that needs to be able to grasp with all those controllers and motors and things that are going to break that nobody's ever going to fix again, right? It's, it's just, yeah. it's, we're not, we don't seem to be thinking about the problem very well from the work and work management perspective, from what we said earlier about productivity and taking away people's time as this stuff makes more efficiency, nor do we seem to be doing a great job of thinking about this from the, what are the standards or expectations around this kind of stuff? So I love that I love that you're focused on creativity and exploration and discovery because those are the, that's the kind of language that gets us into a different way of seeing and thinking about this stuff. Yeah, but also I think that, honestly, I think that the reason for all of this confusion is just confusion about what we are as human beings. Like, I think it goes all the way to say that. More. And say more, say more. <laughs> well, we're just incredibly, like, oddly egocentric um, in the sense that Alan wants Alan Watts was, um, I love him. I've been reading him all year. Um, and he had this piece in one of his books where he talks about how on one hand, we sort of, you know, like we, we think of humans as these sort of all knowing conquerors of nature that need to sort of subdue our environment and to control it and be the masters of our environment. And at the same time, think we think that we're nothing, you know, that like, there is some God who just imposes everything on us. And it's a super weird, like two different completely separate poles of the same sort of type of thinking. But in reality, like we are a part of a greater cosmic whole and human beings are literally just a result of all of the, all of our surroundings and the environment around us. So I think that this lack of understanding of this constant, like, we are nothing and we are just the, you know, like whatever God imposes on us is what is happening in the world or at the same time trying to conquer everything is the starting point for all the confusion in terms of how we think about our role in society and how we build technology and what our relationship ultimately to this technology that we're giving birth to is. Um, so yeah, I mean, it gets pretty like wild and philosophical, but at some point we're gonna have to do this work and sort of like, think the fundamental questions of what we are. <laughs> um, it's funny, it gets philosophical, but it's not out there. Philosoph There's a lot of philosophical art, uh, conversations I end up somehow in where I just really have no idea where we just went. And I don't know why we're like wallowing around in these very abstract uh, waters where everything you just said is philosophical, but incredibly practical. And it feels like it's accessible and stuff we could and ought to be talking about. Um, are there models or people or things that work really work well for you in this and how we might rethink how we think of ourselves? Well, personally, I think that everyone should just meditate. I think it's the most accessible and practical tool for making huge progress in a relatively short period of time um, of making this kind of distinction or <laughs> removing the distinction, really, because that's, that's what it is. And I've thought about this a lot, I, I, but I think that meditation, it's difficult to get started, but it's like with, with after 30 days of sitting down every day for 30 minutes, you start to create that space and you realize that there is a difference in the way that you think and relate with the world. And it's completely free. It doesn't require any equipment. You just sit and stare at a wall 
and give yourself space to recognize the thoughts that are going um, through your mind. So sometimes like earlier in the conversation when I said, when I say technology, I don't necessarily even mean software. I kind of had this at the back of my mind because the different tools that are available to us, uh, there's so many, so many of them and they could be of such different nature, you know, like I'm equally excited about the possibilities of uh, meditation for unlocking human potential as I am of some like really weird next generation internet stuff that we can build. So there is an array of possibilities. I love that. And and the software can help here. I, I, there's a, a really long time ago when we dialed up and you know the, your, your terminal session scrolled past you. There was some online space, I don't remember which one, that had a banner when you entered a, a, a space or a room there. And all it said in the banner was, please take a moment before you enter the space to kind of center yourself, take a breath, whatever it was. And it didn't freeze the keyboard. You could you know, hit return and just excitedly jump right into the space. You could do whatever you wanted. But between the banner that scrolled by that said you were now entering it and this request for you to be a little bit mindful, there was a different nature of space in what scrolled afterward. In this incredibly, you know, if you look back on the days of dial-up and, and blog files, it's like, wow, okay, really? But it doesn't take a lot to invoke that and to cause us to approach things with a slightly different feeling, to, to change the nature of the space inside. Those, some, those things are sometimes very tiny and subtle and not yeah. big. And I don't, I don't know that they're teaching this stuff in the, you know, uh, CX, UX, UI design schools. No, but they should be. Another thing I was thinking of. about the other day was like, if you are, like you, you're, everything is experience. Like if you're, if you're experiencing joy, you're not thinking about experiencing joy. You're literally just experiencing joy. Uh, and as soon as you stop to think about experiencing joy, it's a, it's, you're in a completely different state of mind. And I think that's something about when it comes to like, like if you're trying to, if you're trying to like, if you have a prompt, like uh, build a software company that unlocks human potential through creativity. One of the reasons why I think that discovery is actually a really interesting approach here is because it removes a little bit more the obsession with I or the self from that process of discovery or creativity, sorry. So like mm -hmm. when you're just, and I think that that's one of the things that I'm, I feel I have high conviction for with saying is that if you just write some thought that you had and you can just sort of fall down these rabbit holes and discover things, you are a little bit outside of yourself and uh, within the creative process. And my sort of spiritually curious brain is really excited about seeing what kind of, experiences we, we, we can design for users that allow them to remove as much of the eye within their process of interacting with technology or creating something how did how did the self eat our brains do you have, a, uh, do you have like a, a theory of, of, of history of how, how we got to this moment in society where it seems we're so obsessed with self well, I think that there's probably, there's so, I mean, everything is that. I, I don't know. I talk about this with my mom a lot because um, I'm from Finland. My mom is from Finland. She grew up in Finnish Lapland. And I imagine her childhood to be like her summers just being at her, at her grandmother's farm, touching grass, playing around, doing work, like things that don't require so much self-observation and therefore like self-criticism it's mm -hmm. it seems like so much more down to earth and rooted and grounded um and now we have so much distraction with technology with everything mm -hmm. else as well i'm not being i'm not like i'm not blaming this on like the social media apps or whatever but it's really difficult to get lost in the process of doing something when you're constantly sort of brought back into your immediate self and reality with whatever, you know, notifications or or other disturbances as well. So I think it really is about that kind of like how your attention span, like how you can dive into something and forget about the rest of the world and be present in what you're doing. Uh, as soon as you, if you're reading a book and as soon as you think about the fact that you're reading, you stop reading. Like it's impossible 
to do both. You can't mm -hmm. both read and think about reading. You can only do one. So yeah, maybe it's just like attention span and the way that we use our time or direct our attention. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? Um, one of the things that's gone away a lot with modernism <clears throat> is notions of the collective or the commons or collective good or whatever else. And libertarianism and other things like that are kind of, to my mind, extremist uh, thinking about what happens when you we, when you when you let the the individual predominate and consumerism is all about me and what I want, uh, we've we've replaced notions of society that helped us make societies where people felt a part of the whole, with this very atomized, very separate modern world we live in. And we think modern is good. We think modern like well, we live in the most modern world possible. Look at you know we've got these little slabs of unobtainium that you can call anywhere with for no marginal cost. It's crazy. When in fact, people are desperate for connection. People are, are, are crying out for the kind of stuff that we used to um, center. Uh, the, the collective or the whole was often, part of the reason we didn't have a lot of ego was that the ego and the individual and all that are in some sense a modern invention. And I'm, I'm treading on philosophical ground. I'm not, not like competent in, uh, in, in even saying that. But I'm I'm really interested in this in this pull between the individual and the collective because I think our collective discovery and collective work is something we don't have enough of, see enough of, do enough of, and when we do it and it works and we get a a feeling of joy from doing it, we want more of that because it's very connective, right? Serving the collective, ooh, this is sort of alliterative, is very connective, um, and and we're busy. I have a new friend who was an ex-neo-Nazi and he and I are trying to collaborate on figuring out how do you de-radicalize other people who used to be like, who are still as he used to be. And he's very wise. He's young. He's got, been through a lot. And these are the tropes that come up in our conversations. It's like these young people are really, really desperate for some very simple things, reconnecting with their own senses, with nature, with other people uh, in different ways and anything we can do to further that is good yeah well it's it's really hard we live in a highly complex world where it's incredibly data driven and we have these systems that people don't understand because they're just like the sheer amount of complexity of everything around us is too much to handle and the result is that we end up actually like creating these like complex simplistic frameworks like astrology to help us to make us almost feel like we're making sense of something and yeah. we understand it but it's not based on anything empirical it's um completely just a an invention to make us feel like we understand and we belong and we can connect um and i think that that's that's the biggest challenge is like how do we how do we like go back to our sort of original more human ways of existing and being and thriving when at the same time the world is just going a million miles an hour towards further complexity further like technological advancement further everything and that is a that like going back to the original thing of like how we started this conversation and like what i'm really interested in is like how can we do that how can we unlock this human potential when the world looks completely different than it used to and it's continued it's going to continue to look more and more different and uncertainty will become more and more prevalent in every area of life um and i think that there's a lot of exciting opportunities and answers i'm not trying to at all paint like a uh a, a doom and gloom picture here um but we have to take this as like a legitimate window of opportunity to do the really hard work of figuring that out it's funny because lots of people are out there saying everything is going to continue to change faster and faster uh, and it's inevitable and maybe we're going to slip through a singularity or whatever else. <clears throat> um, there's a notion called punctuated equilibrium, which basically says that things sometimes float along in relative stasis for a long time and then shaboom, a lot of stuff happens, but then they go back into equilibrium. It's not that they keep accelerating. And I'm not sure which of these models I buy right now, whether we're going to go through a singularity and everything will like be vastly different from what we can imagine right now, or if this is just another one of those periods of turmoil. Um, 
but I think it's it's um, even in this moment of turmoil, there are a bunch of things that we just talked about that are constant, consistent, haven't changed since humans started socializing and figuring out how to be society, which is these things about relationship and connection and interdependence and whatnot. And mm -hmm. funny enough, I think these things keep bubbling up because they're really quite essential for how humans live together on the planet. Without them, we do stupid things and we hurt each other and we hurt the planet. Um, so so I'm, I'm interested in that tension between, oh my God, oh my God, everything is you know, going to change faster and faster and technology is just going to get more intrusive and more powerful. Or how do we meditate for 30 minutes a day and come back into relationships and, and realize that despite whatever rate of change and whatever relationships happen, until those changes eat our bodies and we are no longer sort of the biological mechanisms that we think of ourselves as today, which is one of the visions we're heading toward, whether you're a transhumanist or an extropian or whatever. Um, and I'm, I'm not so sure those are going to happen that much. Um, I don't know. I, th I think there's a, a lot of ways to help people find that space. Yeah. I completely agree. And I think that that's why this period of human history is so exciting because like I said, like it's a, it's an opportunity more than anything else. And yeah, I think that that's like ultimately what I've kind of come to the conclusion with is that this is a chance for us to feel like we are part of the greater cosmic whole and to understand what are our most like human qualities and to focus on that more than anything else. Like the world mm -hmm. will keep being fucking crazy and we have an opportunity to recenter and redefine what our relationship to our surroundings look like. Um, how does that relate back to productivity versus creativity, for example? Like what 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 does that mean in in, in those terms? Well, I think it just means like what like <laughs> what is the purpose of anything? Like, I, I don't know. I, I think it's to, to do things that feel interesting and engaging and meaningful and to create as much space in order to think freely and imaginatively as we can. And then to use the fruits of that labor for building things, whatever it may be on whatever level. Um, I think it's as simple as that really. Uh, yeah, and I think like the meditation, the meditation or any kind of like mindful activities uh, are the crucial sort of factor in creating that space. The space will never, like no matter how much time you have in a modern world, if we're conditioned to live in the way that most of us are, I can give you 12 hours, but unless you know how to sort of like come back into something and connect with yourself and sort of take a little bit of space between um you know, like to try to lessen the self or the ego as much as you can, that 12 hours is, is not going to be spent very well. So I think that that's really the key to unlocking that sort of explosive creativity that can come our way. Not to sound too like woo woo, but <laughs> I like it. I like it. And I, I've had moments of explosive creativity. And I, 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 at this point in my life, I kind of count on them showing up every now and then. Um, and I, I kind of know they will. Um, and they're fun because when, when you start sliding into one and, and this feel, this feels like one of them these days, um, it's great. It's exciting. You know, good stuff's going to come out. Yeah. Um, any other things you want to add to this conversation or is this a good time for us to wrap? I think this might be a good beginning of an end <laughs> to the conversation. Is there anything else from your side that you think? would tie it all together or something you'd like to add? Um, we've spun up a whole bunch of different things that, that fit nicely together. I like them a lot. Um, the conversations made me hopeful about where we are and our capacity to make things better because there's a lot of conversations I'm in where at the end I'm like, oh, we're screwed. We're just so completely hosed um, because of forces or whatever that somebody in the conversation described. Um, and I, I I think the challenges in front of us are less complicated than we think they are because mm -hmm. we're we're so flooded by stimuli and news and technology and everything else that we can't actually step back and, and think about um, simpler, better solutions for getting there. And, and yeah. I also think that that 
how humans deal with one another and with these new intelligences matters a great deal. And we had a ton of examples in this conversation about how we're doing that wrong. So um, I think we can come back to that later and, and sort of uh, that, that's probably good good material for, for ongoing conversations. Yeah, for sure. Let's do it. Yeah, I've been calling this like, so I've been calling this like a new paradigm that we should shift towards like away from techno positivism towards like cosmic optimism. And that's what I've been calling it because I think that there's something about this term that signals a lot of unity and greatness. And I still maintain such an optimistic uh, worldview and also truly believe in technology and the scientific method. It just can't be everything. There, There is more beyond that that we need to be willing to lean towards. So, Love that. I'm adding techno-optimism versus cosmic positivism to my brain <laughs> for my notes on this call. Okay. Um, thank you. This has been wonderful. Thank um, you, Jerry. Let's keep chatting. Totally appreciate it. Yeah.